Today we're shifting gears. You know what it means to shift gears. And we're moving from Russia, Eastern Europe to New York. Even though the play that hopefully you've read, Marilyn Gordon, uh, Marilyn Efforts by Gordon, uh, takes place uh, here, it was written there. And I want to give you a little bit a background um, because, you know, Yiddishists tend very often to talk about the kind of Yiddish land where everything Yiddish belongs to the same territory. And I don't always share this opinion. Yes, of course, there's much that is the same, but on the other hand, um, what you have when you um, deal with the United States, with America, is the whole process of immigration. And that changes many things. It changes perspective, it changes sensitivity, sensibilities by nature. But let me just go back very, very quickly to, for a quick summary how it all begins. The Yiddish theater begins in 1876. Do you know where, in what country? In Romania. Uh, in a town called Yash, or Yassi, in, in uh, Jewish text. Why does it start there? How does it start there? Because it's the eve of the, uh, of the war. There is a local Jewish population, but there are also many uh, Jewish merchants who come to town trying to see if there's some business. Before the war, there's always business. And there's a local wine garden, a Jewish uh, wine garden, where two musicians, two singers, perform. Comes to town a gentleman called Abraham Goldfaden, Avon Goldfaden. It's a name to remember because uh, he's a writer. He comes to town to publish a newspaper, but nothing becomes of this. And he starts uh, talking with these uh, two singers, musicians, and he proposes a text that would somehow unite the individual songs of this, basically what it is is a cafe chantant, as they used to call it, into something a little bit with a plot. That, that, so there is some, some sequence to, to what they do. And he does that. It's an immense success. And within a very short while, uh, we have the first company of the theater with Goldfaden, who's really a, a, a genius in this respect, writing the, the, uh, the lyrics, writing the text, writing the music, which he takes from all over. Uh, because he cannot write music and he cannot read music, but he has a very good ear for it. Uh, he does the sets, he does everything except act. And uh, they soon go to Romania, where they're very successful, I mean, to, to the main uh, Bucharest, and then other companies begin to proliferate all over. And suddenly it's like a, like a fire that, that goes from one place to another. We have small theater companies, usually family-based um, across Europe. Now, it's important to note how it starts. It starts with a song. And that music and singing is always in the kind of DNA of the Yiddish theater. It's important to emphasize because it's, it's always there. And why is it always there? Because when you think of it, when the theater just begins, there's nothing. The only trained personnel that we have in terms of performance are what? Who? Think for a moment. Who is a little bit trained? We don't have a school for actors. There's no actors. But there are the chazonim there are cantors who learn how to sing, and there are pupils, the so-called mishorerim. Mishorerim were basically the cantor, the choir that sang with the cantor, very often young boys, who learned music, like in medieval times, you learned the trade from the cantor. And so the fir, almost all the major first uh, stars of the Yiddish theater 
are by nature male, because you did not have women singers, women chazonim, and have a good voice. If you don't have a good voice, you have a bit of a problem in the Jewish theater. This is very unlike the beginning, if you remember what we spoke about yesterday, of the Hebrew theater. The Hebrew theater starts with a word, with a language, with a play, not with music. None of those actors could really sing. Yiddish is different. So, all this becomes very, very popular. One company copies from another. Basically, there are very few scripts. Uh, and and uh, Goldfaden produces these uh, operettas, as they're called, uh, one after the other. Some of them become immensely, immensely popular. And not only do they become popular, but their characters become part of the language. Uh, which one of the most popular? Zwei Kunilemo, the two Kunilemo. Uh, we have the, the character of Schmendrick. We have Kaldunia, the, the sorcerer, the Machshefe. Uh, we have Shulamis. In Shulamis, we have the, probably the most popular Yiddish song of all time, Rojenkes mit Mandlen, Almonds and Raisins. Uh, so these things go all over. It doesn't take long for this to arrive in the United States in America. What happens in the United States after 1881? You have the beginning of the great Jewish immigration to America. Between 1881-82, for obvious historical reasons, and 1924-25, when immigration practically stops, we have around, nobody's sure exactly about the number, but close to three, three million Jews, most of them Yiddish speakers, who moved to America. It's a very large number. And by nature, those who move tend to be somewhat younger, because people who are 80 years old don't pack up and go to another country. Very often single, and most of them concentrate in what we call the Northeast Corridor of the United States. That is to say, uh, Philadelphia, New York, uh, Baltimore, with a great majority settling in New York, uh, many in, you probably heard the term, Lower East Side. Have you heard the term Lower East Side? Okay. The Lower East Side, which is now very chic and cool, was a poor neighborhood back then, at the bottom of, 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 uh, of the city. Uh, they had tenements, which was very, very cheap housing, very often without, uh, without the toilet, without running water. And very often, uh, people worked also in those apartments. Work conditions was very harsh. Most Jews work in the garment industry, in what we call the schmatte business, somehow related to that. Uh, so it was a very Jewish industry, which made it easier for them because on Jewish holidays they, they didn't have to work. They, they, were, they could speak Yiddish to each other. But conditions were harsh, apartments were cramped, and as, but as harsh as it was, there was still some extra money. It was not the kind of poverty that you had in, in Eastern Europe. There was always some extra money, and what did you do with the money to get out? You went to the theater. The theater became immensely, immensely popular. A, because there were a lot of young people who wanted to go out. B, because there was really minimal rabbinic supervision. The power of, of the rabbinate was very weak in the United States. So they perform on Friday night, they perform on Shabbos, uh, nobody stops them. They couldn't do it in Eastern Europe. But in New York you can do basically whatever you want, with some respect of course, but it's done. And so within a very short while we see a booming entertainment business. Just to give you numbers, in 1900, in the year 1900, 
that is to say less than 20 years uh, before immigra uh, after immigration begins, there were about half a million Jews in, in, in New York. There are four huge theaters. We're not talking about little, you know, dungeon theaters. We're talking about theaters that have uh, um, well over a thousand seats each. There were four of them, and it was calculated that they gave, the four theaters gave uh, 1,100, that is to say 1,100 performances per year, and sold about 2 billion tickets. So we're talking about a business. We're not just talking about uh, a little art theater that, that, that uh, uh, houses, uh, you know, uh, 70 people in the audience and is happy if they come. We're talking about really something major. Now, at the same time, what happens in Russia is, of course, a ban on Yiddish theater, Yiddish performance. Uh, the ban is not complete, but it's very difficult to perform in Yiddish. So, Yiddish actors in the 1880s begin to move first to London, because it's easier to go to London, and London becomes a very major place of re-immigration to America. So, the whole thing in the United States begins uh, in 1882, that is to say uh, six years after Romania, after the first performance. Uh, and it's a very small thing at first. It, it, uh, it's a rented space and uh, of course what do you perform? You perform a Volkswagen piece perform the witch. Uh, the one interesting thing about that performance, other than it was the first, is that somehow a young, um, very young teenager called Boris Tomaszewski performed in it. Boris Tomaszewski would later become the biggest star, commercial star, of the Yiddish theater. It was he also started, he had a very good voice, started, he was on the choir of the local synagogue, he, he learned uh, music with the, uh, with the Chazan still in, in Russia, but Boris Tomaszewski is American made. He did not, he did, doesn't have a European career before he moves to America, he starts there. But soon after that, the immigration of major actors, much better known, relatively speaking, actors from Europe, goes on and on. They, they keep coming to the United States. Uh, Tomaszewski and his group have, they have to go to Philadelphia, then they have no clientele in, in, in New York. And um, really, everybody who's major in Yiddish theater arrives in New York. And New York becomes the, the, the mecca, if you want, of the Yiddish theater. Uh, so much so that in 1903, we have the first big theater built especially for Yiddish theater. And it's big and it's elegant. It's the Grand Street Theater. Uh, it no longer exists. Most of these theaters do not exist anymore. But again, Elegant, huge, accommodates, uh, I think, around uh, 1,500 people with galleries and all kinds of elegant things. So whoever invests in it thinks there's money to be made in it. And the theater depends entirely on box office. People have to buy tickets. How does it work? They're constantly offering new things. Constantly, and it's a theater that is still has this kind of slightly a commedia dell'arte quality, where the main thing is the performance of the actor. The texts are written constantly, are provided on an ongoing basis, um, usually uh, by no, well, I wouldn't say usually, but mostly by two writers, one whose name is Latino, the other one is Horowitz who produce plays the way, you know, we, 
they're, they're made fun of today, but the truth is they write the way today we write for television. Every few days a new, a new scene, a new something. Very often the actors have to perform before the play is fully finished. But, but the audience is there and they want more and more and more and more. Remember these are days when there's no television, there's no radio, there's, this is it. This is entertainment. And so the emphasis is on the performance of the actor. And if he doesn't remember his line so well, so he doesn't remember his line, so he adds, he changes it a little bit. Uh, if he sees that the audience is a little bit tired, uh, 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 Tomaszewski starts singing a song about the mommy, uh, which has nothing to do with the play. Um, a lot of stage effects. One, and there's a lot of competition between the, the different troops. Everybody tries to upstage the other. I have one crown, the other one comes with two crowns. I, <laughs> I have a, a play on, on something, the other one, uh, Shlomo Amelech, the other one has uh, a, a week later, Shlomo, Shlomo Amelech and, and his wives. Constant, constant competition. Um, the Yiddish newspapers don't write much about them because they look at it as something so popular and so so not artistic that you know you get more material sometimes from the English language newspaper than from the Yiddish newspapers. Well, one of the major actors who come to America is Jacob Adler. Jacob Adler had a career in London already, and he know, known as the Nishra Godel, the great Adler. And he's a very imposing actor. He doesn't have a great voice. He can sing, but he's not much of a singer. And he yearns for dramatic literature. He admires Russian culture. Uh, he knows it. And he's looking for something with more substance. And so are the, uh, the, the uh, intellectuals who write for the Yiddish press who begin to notice, you know, this is really an important phenomenon, we should pay attention to it. So, whom does he meet? He meets by some arrangement in a, a local coffee shop, uh, Jacob Gordon. Jacob Gordon had just come to, sorry, from Russia. The year is 1891, and Adler is very impressed and says, write a play for me. Gordon never wrote a play before. And Gordon writes a play for Adler, and this would remain throughout his career. He wrote plays for an actor. The play is called Siberia. You can imagine more or less the story, the audience doesn't like it, they shoot it, they don't want it. It's a total failure. But Adler still believes in him. He said, write me another play. And Gordon writes the Yiddish King Lear, the Jewish King Lear. And the Jewish King Lear becomes a phenomenal success. Adler is brilliant as the old, uh, well, not the, a Jewish kind of King Lear. And the critics from Uptown, that's the major English press, come and they're, they're just bowed mostly by two things. A, by the actor. He was really an unusual, great, great actor. One of the great actors of the period, regardless of language. And secondly, by the very, and that's important in, in America especially, the homogeneity of the audience. The audience shares, even though they may, this one could be a Bundist and a socialist and a, and a communist and a, and a, and a, and a well, Hasidim we didn't have, but a, a very religious Jew, uh, there's a bond there, a cultural, ethnic, uh, bond that makes things coherent, and the audience sits like this. They're in rapture. So on the one hand, they're not always very well behaved in, during intermission, before and after, but during the performance, they're the best audience you can think of. And the, the, the writers noted that in an audience that 
that comes from various places, that doesn't share necessarily the, the same culture, you cannot have this strong bond between stage and auditorium. It's, it's like electricity in the, in, the, in the air. And this is when a great career begins. Now, a few, a few words about Jacob Boyd. We'll see him in a minute. Uh, I don't know if you read it, but in the material sent to you, uh, there's an essay by Melch Epstein that is taken from a book called The Eleven uh, Men Who Guided the Destiny of the Immigrant Community in America. And Gordon is one of them, which is not a simple thing because there were some very, very major figures there. So, uh, what is the point? Why is Gordon so important? Because Gordon is, is really a pivotal figure, pivotal, you know, uh, not just in terms, primarily in terms of the theater, but he's also a kind of student of Tolstoy, a follower of Tolstoy. He comes to America with agrarian ideas, with a, with a group called Amolam, uh, that originally wants to settle and work the land, and, and doesn't quite work out uh, very well. Um, he's an intellectual. He's a socialist, a committed socialist. And he's a tough person to deal with. And he comes with the Yiddish is not so great. Because originally he tries to make a living writing for the Russian press in New York, but cannot make a living from that. From the theater, you could earn very nicely. And that's how his writing career begins. Now, when he comes to the Yiddish theater, he says, this isn't theater. I, this is not what it should be. First of all, he says, the actors have to learn the text by heart. They, they cannot do what they do here. They have to speak what I write, and they cannot deviate from that. B, there was this custom of so-called Deutschwillisch. Deutschwillisch was a kind of fake, high German for more important characters. So that the low characters spoke plain Yiddish, and those who were more, you know, uh, princes and kings spoke Deutschwillisch. Enough with it. Gone. We're not doing that Yiddish. We speak decent Yiddish, decent language here. Set the third, you come to rehearsals. And you come to rehearsals on time. And you behave in a professional way. Well, at first the actors rebel against it. They're not, it, it, it was a much, uh, I wouldn't say circus, but it, it was a much more fluid and open culture. And he puts an end to it. He completely changes the culture of the Yiddish theater. And uh, he writes most of his plays about life in the old country. But he touches on all kinds of emotions, conflicts, that are maybe felt in a much stronger way in an immigrant society. Because you have to understand what happens in an immigrant society. Well, you tell me. What happens between parents and children? Children becomes more like American. The children are more American. They have to show the parents how to do things, not the other way around. You know, it's like with, the <laughs> with all the gadgets nowadays, where, <laughs> where you show your, your parents how to deal with the iPhone, not the other way around. Uh, where people are confronted from the moment they set foot in a new world with new people, with new sounds, with new, uh, new landscape, with these tall buildings, with all kinds of things that they, where did they see a Chinese person before? Where did they see a black person? Where did they meet Italians before? Italians lived right next to them and very often worked with them in the garment shop. So everything is new, the smell, the language, the, the, uh, the food, whatever. And as one historian 
put it very nicely, they came to stay. They didn't come to work for a few years, make money and go back home. They came to America, they came to stay there. But there are all kinds of conflicts in terms of religion, in terms of what you should do it, what you shouldn't do, in terms of money, in terms of control. All the pa old power relations that you had in the old country are going through such, some sort of a, a change, a shock in the new country. And so you can write about the old country, but you already have the sensitivities and the sensibilities of immigration. And the, this whole process of immigration, uh, in general, makes very much, in my opinion, a distinction, draws a line between the Yiddish uh, stage culture in Eastern Europe because even if you're given a very hard time, let's say, in Poland, you're not an immigrant in Poland. You may be a second-class citizen, but you're not an immigrant. In New York, you're an immigrant. You're not a second-class citizen, but you're an immigrant. Everything is new, everything is different. You have to learn how to, how to negotiate with things. Uh, as an aside, see if you can see on YouTube, I think you can see the the film, The Jazz Singer. Have you heard of it? The Jazz Singer is the first uh, talkie, the first film that, that had sound to it. It's, it's a historic film. It was made in 1927 in English, not, not... But the story is about the father who's a cantor and the son who's a jazz singer. And, and this is the, 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 the big conflict the Americanized son, and the father who wants his son to be a cantor like him. And the son has a voice, but he doesn't want to be a cantor anymore. He wants to be a jazz singer. So all these things are at work, and when we read Gordon, we also have to keep this in mind. So Gordon in New York is a little different from Gordon in Kiev, or Gordon in, in, in Warsaw. Uh, Gordon writes a few years, uh, in, that, in 81 he writes The Jewish King Lear, and uh, seven years later he writes Mirla Ephraim, known as The Jewish Queen Lear. Uh, one of the things about Gordon that are also interesting is that he's very, very much for women's rights, extremely so. If you read the Jewish King Lear, the, the youngest daughter, the equivalent of Cordelia, you're familiar with King Lear, basically, the basic story. Cordelia, who is Yiddish, so Taibele, what does she want? She wants to go and learn medicine and become a doctor, which she does, by the way. And uh, even though everybody's giving her a very hard time, so it's for women emancipation, for, for women going to school, for women studying, and not just studying and reading novels, going to medical school, becoming doctors. When you think of when it's written, it's very, very, very early. So, oh, and at the end of the Jewish King Lear, King Lear, Jewish King Lear doesn't die. He is nearly blind, but his daughter, uh, Tabele, and her husband, who's also a muscular and the doctor, perform surgery, and he regains his sight. And the sight, of course, is the sight of science and knowledge and learning, and not the Hasidic, uh, uh, of, of his uh, son-in-law. Okay? So, a few years pass by. Um, he writes the Kreutzer Sonata, a play that is somehow that touches on the Tolstoy story, and it's the first uh, play that is translated into English, from Yiddish into English, and performed, not just translated, but performed on Broadway with a Yiddish actress who transfers to the American stage, Bertha Kalish, and becomes a very big star for, for a while 
in English. Okay, going back to um, to our play, uh, the Jewish Queen Lear, Mural Ephros is 1898. He writes it for actress um, Kenny Lipton. And again, it becomes a huge, huge success. And it's a play that is produced to this day. Again, becomes a classic. So now, let's see the PowerPoint. If it's the right one, I hope. Okay, so this is Gordon. At first, you know, those who saw a picture of Herzl, when you see a bust of him, and there are many busts of him, uh, it's a little confusing. You're not sure who that person is, but that's Gordon. Okay, this is something very special. This is called my micrography. Have you heard the term before? Whoa. What is micrography? It's a portrait with letters. With, with Hebrew with, letters. With texts. I'm sorry? Not just, re, not just any letters, with texts like poems or, or prose. Right. But the idea is that you create it out of letters. And this whole thing done after he died is the entire text of Mirla Ephesus. Wow. And if anyone can. Read a little Yiddish. Here it says, Mirve Ephos. Speziell geschrieben für Madame K. Lipton. Kenny Lipton. Especially written for Kenny Lipton. And, so to speak, his last words. Supposedly, just before he died, he said, Finita la comedia. <laughs> not, but this is a beautiful, beautiful work. The original is a Devo. You can this, you can photograph. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's really very, very beautiful. And if you make, the bigger you make it, when you enlarge it, you begin to read the, 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 the text of the play. That's why it's impossible to read. Okay. So, uh, let me say this. Over the years, I told you, this play has become a classic. I don't think there is a major uh, Jewish actress who has not aspired, who, who did not play Miro Ephros. But, uh, so much so that it, it's like a performance anthology over the last, I would say, uh, more than a hundred years. And each one reflects different styles, different uh, cultural norms, different situations. What was accepted then is not accepted 50 years later, is done differently, as is the case with classical plays, always. So, um, one of the actresses who is um, also associated with the role, but not the one who originated, but in Eastern Europe, she was the major uh, actress in general, but also in Merle Ephros, is Esther Rochel Kaminska. Esther Rochel Kaminska was the great, the, the, the mama for the Yiddish theater in Poland, but was recognized worldwide. Now, um, in 1911, she was invited to perform in New York, and the, the what was his name, uh, uh, Michael Mintz, the husband uh, of Kenny Lipton, invited her to perform in Miracle Efforts. So now we have the two grand dames performing the same role. And, it's, and her daughter, Ida Kaminska, you may have heard her name. Ida Kaminska played the little uh, grandson, and in later years would also play Meryl Ephraim. I still saw her performing when she was an old lady. So, it's interesting to read the comparison between the two. 
Abraham Kahn, who was the editor of the Vorwelt, which was the most important Yiddish newspaper in the world, and the editor writes about theater all the time, uh, which shows you how important it is, is writing, and I'm reading to you in translation. He writes, and he clearly favored Lipton. He writes, Lipton's pride, her shrewdness, come not from Lithuania, but from Shakespeare. She was not proud like an ordinary woman, but like a leer. She did not go about the stage like a rich housewife from Grodno or Berdichev, but like a queen. On the mechanical means that help a melodramatic performance, Lipton was more expert than Kaminska. Melodrama was the core of Mirla Efros. But whatever one may say about the fault of a play, her mirror efforts was an outstanding interpretation of the Yiddish stage. Fast forward to 1967. Ida Kaminska comes to New York and plays mirror efforts. And I'll read to you what the New York Times writes about her. And you'll note even from these descriptions, the differences in performance. Miss Kaminska in the title role gives a glowing performance, underplayed, what is underplayed? Toned down, with taste, despite opportunity to shriek and weep. Miss Kaminska never grovels, but acts with little mannerism. Her hands tremble, her face contorts, and she radiates a sad smile of self-sacrifice. It is great acting. So you see the difference in style from the early years of the century, where she's the regal queen. She's not the housewife from Grodno. She is Queen Lear to something much quieter, with less, you know, stage effects, more subdued, more gentle, which we regard as better acting than the, you know. <laughs> okay, so I have a little anthology here for you, and I want to show you more of this. So this is the, the Yiddish Arcanic Leo. This is Jacob Adler. And that was one of his greatest roles. He played it too until he stopped acting. It was stroke. It was stroke. This is 1898. This is Kenny Williams. Okay. Uh, here we have a production in Poland. It, the play was produced all over the world. There is uh, it's hardly a country where it wasn't done in various languages. This is a Vida Kaminska, Mirolefos. Vida Kaminska in New York. Moved it earlier. Okay. This is a Spanish production. This is the film. We'll see a few scenes from the film. This is Hannah Rovina. Remember Hannah Rovina from yesterday? Yeah. Lele, the great star of Abima. We don't have, uh, we can't see, the, of course, the, the, the performance, but we have a, a recording where you can listen to her. And I'll tell you, it, it really tears your heart when she says, I'm leaving. What she does with her voice is, is just really incredible. Yeah, 
quite a few products. Now, 2014, at the Connolly Theater, which is the so-called younger theater in Israel, and, and uh, not so grounded in the old European, uh, tradition, uh, East European tradition, with Gil Almago, today's greatest actress of the Israeli stage, in the role of Mirale. So you see the style is a little different. Remember the chess? Chess playing the play, she plays chess, she's a smart woman. Elegant house. This is the daughter-in-law. In this, what scene is this? If you don't know what scene it is, you never read the play. Which scene is this? I never read the play. This is the last scene. The last scene when she comes home. Okay. This is the Yiddish theater in Israel. Same year, two middle Ephros. A different look. Very different. I think it looks a little more authentic in a way, more Russian than the other ones. The, this is the, the mother-in-law. This is a dramatic school where they produce it. It's again, why do I show you all this to show it gets done again and again and again and again. And it becomes a testing ground for great uh, actresses, especially older ones. So, before we get into the play itself, what's it about? Who did read the play? Uh, uh, Irina has a question. Yeah. Whether these were only Jewish actresses? So did, 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 did uh, a non-Jewish actress ever perform Mirella? I, I, well, make me say that there was in Russia, when it, it was done in Russia in 1905. And there's an actress, I don't know if she's Jewish or not, in Russian called Miriam Trilly. Well, it tells them, they should, they should hear it. Guys, listen to this lady. <laughs> no, 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 it's very important. They just know all of us, it's just because it's interesting. Can you tell us what it is? No, but on the top of that, what in the theater of Sadovsk, there were 10 pieces of the Jewish theater. Yeah, I'm going to pause on it. Uh, the theater of Sadowski, which is very known and it's at the core of Ukrainian theater, they had ten plays uh, from Jewish theater. Gorgin, uh, основном Gorgin, Shalom Ash, and a few of Goldfarbs. Good. На украинском языке украинские актеры имели огромный But uh, according to the information I have, the first. Um, Production in Ukrainian was in 1936. No, much earlier. Much earlier. Uh, so, so, so the art museum and uh, cinema, art, there are two photographs of Lenitska in uh, 
Кроме этого был еще убой, тоже Горгина, она Эстер поиграла. То есть у нее был широчайший диапазон от девушек до мира, то есть вот именно в еврейском репертуаре. Шестой это уже в Гассете Киевском. Там уже Ада Сонс и Зинаида Мурованная в роли Мира Леонидовна.
because those who read the play may notice that at some point the, the, the in-laws who are very posty and very simple folks who have no, no information, no knowledge, no culture, uh, when they hear the name Mozart, they, they have no idea what, uh, what it means. And Mozart music, the, 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 they think, is matzo music. Thing. So there is this mission of the educator to teach about about the culture, the general culture, and, and make them more cultured. That's one explanation. The other explanation, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, it helps him in structuring his play. Whatever it may be, it's a very interesting decision by a writer. Even as he's getting very sure of himself, not at the very beginning, uh, to do that. One, uh, one thing that, that I could think of is not perhaps an American source, but a Russian source. Because at the time, um, Lear, Shakespeare in general, and Lear in particular, are very popular in Russia. And there are reports um, of, uh, who was it, some famous, I don't remember his name offhand, a uh, journalist who comes to Russia and, and is amazed. He goes into some school in the village and the children learn uh, King Lear. So uh, it is popular, but even more so, what is interesting to me is, is the story by Turgenev about the Russian King Lear. And I'll read to you the, the beginning, and, and there's an interesting uh, point that is made here. And this is how the story begins. It's a translation from Russian into English. We were a party of six gathered together one winter evening at the house of an old college friend. The conversation turned on Shakespeare, on his types, and how profoundly and truly they were taken from the very heart of humanity. We admired particularly the truth to life, their actuality. Each of us spoke of the Hamlets, with an S, plural, the Othellos, the Falstaffs, even the Richard the Thirds and Macbeth. The two last only potentially, it is true, resembling the prototypes whom we had happened to come across. And I, gentlemen, cried our host, a man well past middle age, used to know a King Lear. How was that? We questioned him. Oh, would you like me to tell you about him? Please do. And he begins to tell the story of a Russian uh, aristocrat and so on and so forth. So the idea of seeing reality through the lens of a fictional character is very interesting. Do we still do it? Yes. Oh, he's a real, finish the sentence. Don Quixote. We say that somebody is a Don Quixote. What do we mean? He's a dreamer. He doesn't see reality. We basically see a character through the lens of a fictional character who never lived, who never happened, who's the, 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 comes from the imagination of a poet. We certainly do it with television and we do it with movies. All the time. We see characters through that. It helps us, it somehow helps us navigate reality. These fictional characters that are really not historical and never really happened. So that could be, uh, so maybe Gordon thought, hey, if Turgenev can write about a Russian King Lear, I can write about a Jewish King Lear. Why not? Okay. Uh, is it still done? Yes. These great works of literature uh, still call for new interpretation. Their variation on the Lear theme in, in uh, American and, and British uh, literature. And come up repeatedly. 
So, what, what does he address? What kind of, of, of emotions does he address in the play? The play, to summarize it, because it is pretty big, the play deals with Mirla Efros, who is a rich widow, very successful businesswoman, who, who's, who has two sons, her husband died some years earlier. We later find out that the husband left them almost bankrupt, and she managed with her own hands and her intellect to build a wonderful, successful business. And she rules the house like a queen. She's an aristocrat, an old school Jewish woman, uh, very generous, but very demanding. She has two sons. One of them is called Yosele, and Yosele is about to get married. And she decides that instead of having an educated city uh, girl, she will choose somebody from a good but very poor family. Why? Because that will enable her to keep control over the son and the household. And so she goes to a smaller town, a poor town, and finds and, and they find this girl who's a very beautiful girl, but penniless. The, the parents are real schnoils, if you know the word. They, they have nothing. Uh, and they tried like leeches to get more and more money out of her. And she, the son, Yosele, who's a little bit, she treats him, he's, a, he's about to get married, she treats him as if he were a five-year-old boy. Uh, he marries her, even though the Mirror begins to have some second thoughts about it because she doesn't like the parents, but the wedding takes place and the girl and her parents move to Godno to the big house. And gradually there begins, of course, a conflict between the young woman and Mirale. And it's a power, it's a conflict, conflict over power and over money. And at some point uh, she says to her, you cannot treat your two sons like little children. It's their inheritance, and it's their money, and you have to give it to them and let them live like men. And then Mirla comes up with a story, it's not really their money, it's my money. I made it. I'm the one who was successful. But things get worse and worse, and uh, there's a point where Mirla says, enough is enough. I leave the house. She leaves the house and goes to live with her uh, former financial assistance family. And she says, I don't care. I'll be a maid. I cannot live like that. And of course, once she leaves everything, the business doesn't work well. It's uh, all kinds of nonsense that are being done. And it, it's, she refuses to come back. It's also, of course, not a big honor for the family that the mother has left. But this is the way it is. Um, it, about 10 years pass by, she doesn't set her foot there, but then it's the grandson's bar mitzvah. And she says, I'm not coming, I'm not going. But finally, the, the very proud uh, daughter-in-law comes and pleads with her. And it's clear that it's not easy for her to come and ask for forgiveness and invite Mirabe. And Mirabe said, no, I will not. But at the very end, the very, very end, the young boy who's named after the dead grandfather manages to bring Mirale, and she comes into the house and joins the festivities. Now, there are, before we see some of these scenes, there are, we don't have much time to talk about it. There are two things that are associated with Mirale efforts, two props. What are props? In the theater, what is a prop? Uh, decoration. I'm sorry. Decorations, no. Prop. Prop. Let's say Hamlet with a skull. The skull is a prop. You saw pictures of Hamlet holding a skull. 
The skull is called a prop. A prop is something, usually something you can move that is associated with a character. And all the transformations somehow um, are reflected also through the different uses of this prop, of this object. With Mirabel, we have two things. We have a chair and we have a stick. Now think of it, a stick. We don't know what the stick looks like, but we know it's a stick. She bangs with it. Now what does a stick stand for? Think of it. All the meanings that it carries, a stick. Something supporting you when you're standing. Okay, to help you, it helps you to walk, which means that you're a little old, that you're a little fragile. You need assistance. But what, what, what else? A stick. In Jewish culture, it's like a modern stick. The stuff, yes. The stuff of Moses. Okay. What else? The scepter. A symbol uh -huh. of power. Yes. Power. Symbol of all. Power, of course. And you see the stick with her from the beginning to the end. Using the stick at first to show that this is what I want. And gradually, this is what I need to walk. So, what we see that the, here is that the very proud Mirale uh, loses her power and the stick loses its references. The other thing is a chair. What is a chair? It's her chair. <coughs> Now, in many places, we have our own chair. This is my chair. No, like it. What else is a chair? What does it remind you of? A stick in a chair is a, a special chair that nobody else is supposed to sit. Yeah, it has to, it's and it's wrong, right. right. Now, there's a whole fight between Mirla and the daughter-in-law about the chair. The daughter-in-law wants to get rid of the chair. To get rid of the chair means to get rid of Mirla. And at the end, at the very end, when Mirla returns, she brings the chair and she says, here, here's your chair, sit here. And she says, no, I don't need it anymore. I've gotten used to sitting on different chairs. <laughs> Guys, tomorrow we're doing two plays. And we're doing two plays that that are important also from an American perspective and are not related to each other at all. It's just that we have a double session. The first one is a God of Vengeance, which is a play that, that uh, is very much now in the news in the United States. And the other one is the melting pot. That's where the term, if you heard the term the melting pot, comes from. And it's, a major, major play written in English, not in Yiddish. We're switching now to the other side. Uh, try to read it. Try to read it because we have no film there. Sorry. <laughs> so uh, you'll need to, to know what the story is. Because we can't even read together in class. You have the text in Russian, I have the text in English doesn't come together. And God of Vengeance is a very, very strong play. God for Nakume. Read it. And the other one is a classic. Everyone in America knows about the melting pot. Every, the term, the melting pot, how do you say it in Russian? A schmelzstoff of Yiddish. The image of America is a melting pot. That's a major image of the United States, and then comes from a Jewish play. So, so try and read them. <laughs>